He may have committed his crimes before many of you were born, but they inspired countless films that all of you may have shivered under the covers watching for decades. This is the story of Ed Gein, the deranged killer who decorated his home and wardrobe with the skin and bones of his victims. But before we go any further, let's take an intimate look at his formative years to see if we can unearth what drove him to such heinous acts. Edward Theodore Gein was born on August 27, 1906, in La Crosse, Wisconsin, to a deeply devout, God-fearing family. The second child of George and Augusta Gein, he was raised under the thumb of the Old Testament and his mother's vindictive outlook on the evils of the world. Her spite for her husband's alcoholism, as well as his inability to keep a job, drove her to further loathe modern life and all its hellish trappings. And when Ed was only eight years old, she demanded that the family move on to an isolated farm in Plainfield, Wisconsin, away from any ill influence. On the farm, Gein and his older brother Henry were worked to the bone with household chores and mentally overwhelmed with the overbearing lectures of their mother. Their only respite came from their trips to school, but this is when people started noticing that something wasn't quite right with Ed. Teachers and students both noticed his offbeat and solitary nature and often found him bursting into sudden, unexpected laughter, seemingly for no reason. The few times he did make friends at school, his mother would berate him for finding interest in such unholy influences and would ban them from the house. Edward's brother would often stand up for him, but Gein was at this point too enveloped in his mother's love and heeded her wishes without question. The only one who so selflessly and wholeheartedly jumped for Augusta's desires, Ed would often meet the butt of his father's disdain for his domineering wife and would take beatings regularly because of his unquestioning acceptance of her every demand. Due to a combination of his unstable home life and increasingly insulated social life, Ed would drop out of school at the age of 12 to focus on the farm, the only thing that truly mattered to his mother. His hopeless pursuit for his mother's approval would come to be the crux of Gein's disturbing and devilish behavior, as what came next would only be the beginning of a series of shocking revelations that would change the town of Plainfield forever. After dropping out of school, Ed and his brother would take take odd jobs around town as sort of handymen, making money to keep the farm together and pay for daily expenses. They would both come to be known throughout Plainfield as honest, hard workers who were incredibly reliable and kind. Ed was said to always make time for a joke and ask about a person's day, but aside from this, not much was known about their life on the farm until April Fool's Day 1940, in no joking manner whatsoever, Ed's father George passed away due to heart failure. After this moment, Ed's brother Henry would become more defiant in the face of their mother's domineering persona, and many believe that this may have begun to get under Ed's skin, because on May 16, 1944, Henry would die under sudden and mysterious circumstances. While fighting a brush fire on their property, Gein would go on to say that the two got separated and he went in search of help from town. But when he directed people to the farm, he with no hesitation led them straight to the location of Henry's lifeless body. Medical examiners at the time found unusual bruises on the back of Henry's head, but initially concluded that he had died of asphyxiation while fighting the fire and hit his head on a rock. Hmm, likely story. Oddly enough, he was not burned or injured otherwise. He was also found lying face down, so there is no way that he could have hit the back of his head on a rock. Further investigations were never pursued, and the case was shrugged away as a terrible accident. No matter what really happened on that day, it would send shockwaves through the small community for years to come. Grief-stricken by the death of her oldest son, Augusta would have a stroke that would leave her paralyzed. Her swift downturn left Ed doing whatever he could to nurse her back to health, and he would become even more isolated as the two finally had nothing between them. He would often share a bed with her, stroking her hair at night and consoling her in her grief. Whatever she needed, whenever she needed it. Ed Gein was a loyal dog. 
to his mother. After visiting a man known as Smith to purchase straw with her, she became irate when the man started beating a dog and a woman ran out of his house to tell him to stop. Now, Augusta wasn't upset that Smith was beating the dog. No, she was incensed that Smith had another woman visitor. Calling her Smith's harlot, she worked herself into a fury and Gein had no choice but to take her home. Unfortunately, the excitement pushed Augusta to have another stroke and her health would quickly break down afterward. Augusta Gein would die on December 29th, 1945. It is said that at her funeral, Ed cried uncontrollably like that of a small child. The psychological abuse that she had subjected him to throughout his life left him ill-equipped to handle anything on his own. And now that he had nobody to direct him, he spiraled out of control, pulling everyone in Plainfield into a whirlwind 39 years in the making. So how long have you known Mr. Seven years. Seven years. What kind of a man did you know him as? Well, a man a nice man, just like anybody else. The only difference I'd say in the man, he seems to be a little hot. Ed would section off the parts of his home that his mother used to dwell in, fashioning them into a shrine of sorts and what many believe was an attempt to repress the fact that she had actually died. He neglected the rest of the house, and over the years, trash would pile up. Floors, walls, furniture would enter a state of disrepair. But his mother's rooms remained spotless, untouched by the passage of time. Gein would only be seen taking odd jobs from this point, but otherwise would get lost in pulp magazines depicting taboo topics such as cannibalism or even the growing ideology of Nazism. It was 1947 by the time Gaines' mental health decline would result in a series of dissociative episodes that would give him his terrifying moniker. It would start with the grave robbings. Gaines would unearth fresh graves of local women to collect their bodies and bring them home. Unable to let his mother go, Gaines would use these women's body parts to create a, quote, woman suit so that he could literally crawl into her skin. To achieve this, he carefully peeled the skin off the bodies of the stolen cadavers to make literal face masks, leggings, gloves, corsets, and even a, get this bullshit, a belt made out of human nipples. Ed would also decorate his home with other body parts in pursuit of his sick new obsession. He would decorate his bed with skulls on the bedposts, made bowls from the chopped off tops of skulls, chairs tanned with human skin, and, for the love of, a lampshade made out of a human face. This guy had seriously gone off the deep end. Over the next decade, there would even be a string of disappearances in and around his town, most of which would go unsolved to this day. One of these missing people was Mary Hogan, the owner of a tavern which Gein frequented. Nobody knows if all of his horrifying home improvements truly came from the recently buried or from those who had disappeared. But what I would like to know is why you haven't clicked that like button yet. If you like staying informed about all the unimaginable crimes and sick bath out there, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. On November 16th, 1957, Gein would finally let the mask slip in very public fashion, and in less than 24 hours, his decade of decadence would be unveiled for the entire world to see. This was the crime of the country at this particular November in 1957. Gein would become obsessed with a local hardware store owner by the name of Bernice Warden and would often visit her store and flirt with her, buy items from her shop, and make advances, asking her out on dates. Warden would kindly decline but remain courteous and help him with any shopping he needed to complete. She would go on to tell her son, Frank, of these awkward encounters, and when he went to check on her on the afternoon of November 16th, he would walk into a scene of sheer insanity. Upon arrival, Frank would find a trail of blood leading out of the store and the cash register empty. He already had his horrified suspicions, but it was further solidified when he checked the shop receipts and found the last person to have purchased something from the shop. It was none other than Ed Gein, and his morning purchase of antifreeze would prove to be the first domino in the cascading revelations to come. One group of officers would arrest Gein under suspicion, who was found at a neighbor's house having dinner, and another would investigate his farmstead for any trace of Warden. 
Unable to enter the home, they instead checked the shed behind the property and were utterly floored by the discoveries they would make. One officer would shine his flashlight over what he believed to be a dressed deer carcass hanging from a hook, but upon further inspection would find it to be a decapitated and gutted human body. Further investigation found the severed head of the body in a burlap sack, and unfortunately, it was that of Bernice Warden. Now this kind of display is shocking even today, but for a rural town in the 1950s, this was unheard of and shook the responding officers to their core. But it gets worse. Yes, worse than skin suits and even flesh furniture. Investigators would find the peeled face of missing tavern owner Mary Hogan in a paper bag and her skull in a box. They would find the dress of a young girl and most disturbingly, the sexual organs of nine women in a shoebox. What kind of person would even think of doing sh like that? The monstrousness of these crimes would actually send one officer to his grave from the trauma, not a decade later. The Plainfield Butcher was interrogated for his crimes, and his admission of guilt was very forthcoming. Gein told investigators that he had shot Warden in the back of the head before loading her in his truck and taking her corpse back to the farm. He also came clean to doing this years earlier to missing woman Mary Hogan. In an attempt to get closer to his deceased mother, he would use these women's fresh skin to add to his woman suit. What a f psycho. No pun intended. Gein would admit to nearly 40 counts of grave robbing in the years since his mother's death, stealing the bodies of middle-aged women who looked like his mother. He would describe the process of tanning their bodies and creating his human set pieces. He would even go so far as leading investigators to the very graves he defiled, corroborating his deeds with shocking accuracy. Arraigned for first-degree murder on November 21st, 1957, Edward was diagnosed with schizophrenia and found not guilty for his crimes by reason of insanity. He was interred at Central State Penitentiary for 11 years before he was found mentally competent for another trial. On November 14th, 1968, Gain was again found not guilty by reason of insanity and would spend the rest of his life in an insane asylum. He would die on July 26, 1984 of lung cancer. But while his body ceased to be, his spirit, his influence, would continue to persist even today. The life of Edward Gein would shake the world and forever mutate people's perception of horror. His tale would bleed into popular culture and inspire countless films that borrowed influence directly from his sad upbringing down to the very acts he committed. The first example of this came in Alfred Hitchcock's 1960 horror classic, Psycho, where hotel owner Norman Bates' unhealthy obsession with his dead mother was a key plot point. Bates would come to stalk a woman that resembled her, and he would even dress up as his dead mother in a series of dissociative episodes. Another film that would notoriously cannibalize the life of Gein would be 1974's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, a tale of a reclusive and dysfunctional family of cannibals who butcher people like cattle and hang them on hooks. The title character, Leatherface, would wear the skin of people he had killed over top his own face. He would also rob graves from a nearby graveyard to craft terrifying effigies and furniture for his family's home. One of the most blatant retellings of Gein's actions came with the antagonist to 1991's The Silence of the Lambs, Buffalo Bill. Bill would suffer from gender dysphoria, and in order to feel more comfortable in his own skin, would kidnap and kill women in order to turn them into a, quote, woman suit for himself. Not so subtle. Not so subtle at all. These were only a few examples of the many, many films that took influence from the deeds of the Plainfield Butcher. His unnatural acts have infected the core of horror cinema, and the list of films, like his notoriety, continues to grow every single day. This has been the story of Ed Gein, the man who forever changed the world of both crime and cinema with his barbaric acts. I can only hope that nobody outdoes this genuine psycho. But who knows, because there are thousands, if not more, deranged killers still out there. Only time will tell.